current health care crisis is taking a financial toll on many rural American families. Farm bankruptcies are up 8% from June 2019 to June 2020. Paying for basic needs, such as prescription drugs, has become a struggle for many. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of Rural America Live with AARP and to our listeners joining us on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. The rising cost of prescription drugs is a hot button issue in just about every corner of the United States. And we want to hear your stories. How is the pandemic economy affecting you? Are you coping? Are you having to make choices between paying for prescription drugs and other needs? Our question of the month. Are your drug costs affecting your household budget? We're giving away Yeti coolers tonight to five lucky on-air callers. Callers 1, 4, 7, 9, and 11 will be the lucky winners. You don't need to be a member of AARP or over 50 to win. As a reminder, you can win only once each calendar year. You can give us a call at 877-283-7570 and join the conversation. We're ready to take phone calls. We want to let those who are winners tonight also know that AARP will call you back. Not tonight, but they will in the next few days to confirm your mailing address. So don't worry. If you win, you will be getting that Yeti cooler. Well, joining me live tonight from, uh, from our friends at AARP, we've got uh, a couple of folks uh, a little bit later on. But right now we have uh, Sean here with us. Sean is the Wisconsin AARP State Director and Sam Wilson uh, Sam's here with us uh, on the screen right now. And Sam, always good to have you on the show. Uh, let's start right here. We know that the rising costs of prescription drugs is taking a toll on a lot of different Americans. So I'm sure we'll probably hear stories tonight about the difficulties that some people are facing. What are you folks at AARP hearing? Yeah, we're hearing a lot, John, about this continuing struggle. We've been working on prescription drug issues at AERP literally for decades. I know I can count my years at AERP on almost all my hands or my fingers and toes, and we've always had a prescription drug issue, and that continues to remain for folks. You know, AERP has been doing a lot of research about the prescription drug costs. And you know, one of the things that we've studied is some of the recent increases in some of the more popular brand name drugs. And what we found is over a time period from about 2012 to 2017, the average cost of a brand name prescription drug rose about 58%. Now, that seems like a lot, but when you put it in context, it's even more outrageous because the average income in my state of Wisconsin only rose by about 12 to 13 percent for a working family during that same time period. Then put that in the context, if you're a retiree and you're not working and you're just relying on Social Security, the increases to that benefit were only about 7% over that same time period. So you're seeing a dramatic rise in prescription drug prices, no downward pressure on those costs. And the whether you're working or uh, whether you're retired and relying on retirement income, neither of those sources of income is keeping up. And it's not isolated to Wisconsin in and of itself. I know I was talking to my colleague, Sean Voskel, who will be joining us hopefully shortly, um, that in his own state, income had only risen about 2.6% during that five-year time period. So that's dramatically less than even what we saw in Wisconsin. So those price increases for prescription drugs uh, really making a negative impact on people's pocketbooks in the state of Oklahoma, as well as my home state of Wisconsin. Sean is here. Uh, Sean, welcome. Good to have you joining us here tonight. What are you hearing from Oklahomans in your state? Well, it, it, everyone's struggling. The pandemic, um, low commodity prices, uh, people are really struggling and, and, you know, they're asking about another stimulus. And so a big, big driver of that is the high cost of prescription drugs. And, and I think Sam was just talking about, you know, our income's not growing as fast as uh, the inflation of prescription drugs. And, um, you know, we're really concerned. I mean, recently, a couple months ago, we've heard about a new vaccine that could uh, help people with, with COVID-19. And we heard that cost could be around 3000 or more. And I think people just can't understand why would it cost that much when taxpayers, you and I, have funded $100 million of the 
the our research and development for that prescription drug. So uh, I hear the word price gouging a lot. So, um, you know, whether we encourage our attorney generals, Department of Justice, uh, you know, we, we've got to bring this prices down, especially if they're giving those prescription drugs at a lower amount to people in other uh, countries. Well, AARP has been gathering stories from people all over and across the country. And um, we want to share with one woman uh, what one woman has to say about spending just thousands of dollars a year on insulin. Let's take a look at this. My name is Connie Ramos Caivi. I am a mother, a grandmother, and a wife. I also have diabetes. Every day I have to take 65 units of insulin that helps me be there for my family and be there for my community. Last year, I spent $6,000 on insulin, and every year it goes up higher. The high cost of insulin has forced me to make a decision on whether to buy groceries, pay my bills, or pay for the insulin that I need to keep me alive. I know I am not alone. Americans across the United States face these decisions every day. You know, um, she's not the only one either. You know, there's got to be thousands of people all over mm -hmm. uh, that are watching and listening here tonight that ha are there in that same uh, that same situation. Let's talk a little bit about the administration's actions to lower some of these drug costs and uh, uh, related related things. Um, Sam, uh, what do you think? How do you do this uh, specifically? Uh, what is this? I know that there's a measure that uh, you folks have kind of been working on, put a little bit of pressure on some of the drug makers. Uh, how does how does all this work? What do you where do we go from? Here? Well, we did get a little direction uh, from the president earlier this summer uh, when he introduced four executive orders with the intention of lowering or putting downward pressure, at least on the cost of prescription drugs and putting a little pressure on some of the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you know, to date, an executive order really has to be, you know, filed in the federal register. Rules and regulations have to be created. Um, you have to go for comment periods at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Service. There's a long process. And I think the intention was that if you can get the pharmaceutical manufacturers to the table, if they see sort of a hammer hanging over their heads, that perhaps that could do some good to the prices. Um, we unfortunately haven't seen that impact uh, very dramatically, at least uh, since the executive orders were announced. So uh, we're continuing to keep an eye on the progress of that and see if there's any uh, anything, any movement on that front, as well as anything in Congress. You know, it's an election year. It's tough to get anything passed in an election year, so we may be in a holding pattern for quite some time. Sean, a lot of older Americans are on high blood pressure medicine, and a lot of those are also dealing with type 2 diabetes, sure. and sure. these are these are the drugs that we're seeing as uh, going up in price. Yeah, and what's unfortunate about that, even during a pandemic, uh, the, the, but people are struggling, we're still seeing those prices go up from five to 7%. So let's take a look at the top five uh, uh, drug prices increase in 2020. And uh, let's go through those. And these, and these are very essential drugs, life-saving drugs for so many people. Uh, we've all heard about Humira. It treats the rheumatoid arthritis. That's up 7.4%. Uh, Revlimid treats cancer. And that's gone up 6% in just 2020. Benicar treats high blood pressure up 5%. Genuvia helps control type 2 diabetes, which we know um, is really rampant. And, and a lot of, in Oklahoma especially, diabetes is a concern, and not only for all people, but the tribal communities as well. Lyrica uh, treats nerve and muscle pain, and that's up almost 5%. So again, pandemic or not, the prices are going up, and just when it's hitting the people in the pocketbook the most. Okay, but you know what? There, there are some cost savings that we can. There's some help. Okay, where do where do people turn to then for help? This uh, and if right you, now on the screen we've got a website yeah. up here. Talk to that. Well, I, I think it's important to point out um, there are a lot of resources resources out there. And tonight we're going to talk about some some tips for you, and we want to hear from you as well. What? How are you saving money on prescription drugs? But if you go to needymeds.org. Uh, and click on patient savings, you're going to see a lot of brand name, generic drugs. You can see the whole list on the screen. And um, so there's some tips on how you can save money. 
look under brand name drugs, generic, the program name list, uh, the company name list, the program applications, their $4 generic discount drug programs. And there's also a discount drug card through needymeds.org. But also um, what we what people also need is navigating some of the pharmaceutical rebates that are out there. And this website will help you get through that uh, navigation maze by, um, you know, each pharmaceutical company manufacturer could have a rebate for each prescription drug. So if you're on more than one, uh, th this website would help you be able to see what what the manufacturings are providing in rebates instead of having to go to each one separately. So, you know, th that's a lot of uh, time and money saved right there. Sean, does there seem to be a reluctance of some folks who say, well, I, I don't want to uh, try a generic, it's not name brand. Is there a is there some kind of a roadblock there that some people are, are concerned about when it comes to just trying to save money? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, as we turn the TV on, uh, there's so many commercials, there's so much advertising on, on certain name brand drugs. And so I, I think the marketing works for a lot of people. So they think, well, I need this drug. You know, I saw it on TV. But again, I, I would ask your, your physician, your pharmacist, um, you know, is this the right drug that I need? Is there a generic equivalent that that's just uh, just as good that pr will provide the same results? So, you know, ask your physician and perhaps your pharmacist what uh, if there's some cheaper options than the name brand drugs you see on a lot of advertisements. Uh, that's a, that's a very good point. Well, I tell you what, we're up against a break. We're going to take a very short uh, break here, and when we come back, we'll take your calls and give away a few Yeti coolers at the same time. We want you to join the conversation. So give us a call, 877-283-7570. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Free DNA tests targeting seniors is a new spin on the Medicare scam. Here's how it works. You get a call or a knock on your door from someone claiming to be from a genetic testing site offering you a free DNA cancer screening test that's been approved by Medicare. They ask for your Medicare number or insurance card and tell you Medicare will pay for the test. You receive a kit with instructions on how to perform the test and where to send the kit once you're done. The company then scams Medicare by using your Medicare information and charging them for the test. Avoid this scam and don't share your Medicare or Social Security number with anyone who contacts you out of the blue by phone or email or shows up unannounced at your door. For more tips on how to avoid scams, go to aarp.org slash broadwatchnetwork and make sure to tune in to RFD-TV the third Thursday of each month for Rural America Live with AARP. Welcome back. We're talking about the rising cost of prescription drugs. And we want to hear from you and your stories. Is the cost of your medications causing you hardship? Is there one drug that you take that you have a hard time paying for? Well, join our conversation and give us a call. The telephone number is 877-283-7570, and we would love to hear, with, uh, hear from you. So we're here with our friends from AARP, Oklahoma AARP State Director Sean Voskel joins us live from Edmond, just outside of Oklahoma City there, and Wisconsin AARP State Director Sam Wilson, live in Middleton. Gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to have you on uh, the show here tonight. Sam, I want to start here with you. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey found that some households across the country are having difficulties in many areas of their life right now because of the current health crisis that we're under. What did that survey find when it came to paying for necessities? Yeah, I know a lot of people have uh, been positive, positively impacted by some of the stimulus payments that came uh, initially out of Congress and signed by the president. Uh, a lot of people have been getting unemployment benefits if they've uh, been released from their uh, from their job, even though some of those payments were delayed. But even with all of that support and assistance, about 40 percent of people have said that they have had difficulty paying for even the most basic necessities, whether that's food or rent um, or um, utilities, anything associated with those household costs on a monthly basis. When you then look at sort of health care costs, you've got you know, about 22% of folks saying that they're falling behind on their credit cards. You know people 
need to buy those prescription drugs in whatever way they can. So a lot of those expenses we're hearing, unfortunately, are going on to those credit cards. And unfortunately, we know that that bill comes due uh, one day. So you've got an enormous amount of pressure uh, on the economy, on individuals right now as a result of of the pandemic. And unfortunately, the way it looks in Congress, there wasn't any action before they went into recess. So we're unsure what kind of financial support remains for folks uh, in 2020 to help with some of these costs they're having difficulties with. Well, you know, a lot of folks in our audience tonight might fall into one of those categories. We're going to go to the phones right now, and we want to hear from you. Are you facing challenges paying for necessities? prescription drugs and or everyday needs, you can call us at 877-283-7570 and join the conversation just like Sharon has from Utah. Good evening, Sharon. Welcome along. Uh, what's your question or comment? Well, a little, a little of both. I kind of got a shock treatment this week. My mother is 95. She went in because she has shingles, and the doctor gave her some prescriptions today. My husband just got out of the hospital mm -hmm. last week after having a stroke, which uh, affected his left side. So he has diabetes, he has heart disease, mm -hmm. he has bladder cancer, and uh, his kidneys are in stage mm -hmm. four. So he takes a lot of different medicines. One affects, you know, whatever. But I went in, to, they wanted oh, to change his diabetic medication, just that. He also takes for heart. And it was $400 a month copay, copay. And then my mother, she needed some cream for the pain because the, the shingles is on the top of her head. Uh, the the nerve that goes around her eye, and she had broken out with this rash of puff, pus bubbles, and you know her head had black stuff. Anyway, he gave her a cream for pain so she could sleep at night, and he, she's just supposed to spread it on there. They wanted seventy five dollars for a cream, and that's her copay. And I keep wondering. Here's my problem: I don't want the government to give us money. These pharmacies are making a money hand over foot. Why the heck they charge Americans for the creation of a I understand I go to Mexico I get this stuff for a fraction what you have to pay here I just can't afford to go to Mexico every time and I don't understand why we are being eaten alive and other countries aren't having to pay this kind of money why can't this be controlled without our government printing more money so to speak John well I th I mean I think she summed it up perfectly um, what so many millions of Americans are feeling with the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, I, I'm not sure where they're at on, on uh, if they're on Medicare, there may be some opportunities to look and compare uh, Medicare plans or Medicare Advantage plans. And just so you all know, open enrollment for that would be uh, October 15th through December 7th. Um, but again, I, I think this is a great time for some advocacy as well, because, you know, President Trump has put some issues out there about importation. Why are we uh, paying uh, more than other countries? And, and so importation is an issue out there as well. But um, we really need congressional action to lower prescription drug costs. Several states are, are capping um, co-pays for insulin as, as, as a way to help people with those types of prescription drugs. But, you know, I, I believe she's really got to the heart of the matter is we, we've got to have some relief, and, and a great way for us to do that is let our members of Congress know, our U.S. senators and our United States representatives, as well as our state legislators, how we've got to have relief. And in this election year, so hold their feet to the fire. Um, ask your uh, members of the Congress what they're going to do to bring down the high cost of prescription drugs, because we've got to collectively, as a voice, demand change. Sharon, thank you very much for the call, and congratulations. Uh, you're a winner uh, on one of those Yeti coolers. Well, let's uh, turn our attention now to Nebraska, as Philip joins us now. Philip, what's your question or comment tonight? Hello, sir. Um, my call is it regarding cost. It's actually securing the actual medicine. I was curious, does AARP have any plans to work with the Congress and senators to encourage drug manufacturers to make some more product in the United States versus overseas? Sam, I know that uh, we had mentioned earlier that you folks are working with Congress. Uh, uh, you want to tackle this one? You know, it, there's been a lot of really interesting discussion about how many of the precursors for prescriptions. So, right, they're just like anything else. They've got ingredients. And how many of those ingredients are actually purchased overseas from China, from India, from the Philippines? And they may be brought into the United States 
and manufactured here, or they may in fact be manufactured overseas uh, and then imported into the United States. I, I think that there's a lot of people that are really concerned about sort of that supply line for prescription drugs and how do we control that for both cost and quality purposes. So there are people having discussions about where our prescription drugs come from. Unfortunately, what we are seeing though is back to the previous caller, to date, even the drugs that are being made safely, they're being transported securely. The United States consumer is absolutely uh, being taken to the woodshed on the prices. And you have the same drugs being, even if they're made in other countries, being sold at a fraction of the cost uh, to their citizens as compared to people in the United States. So uh, the caller's right. There are some of those issues of where do we make the prescription drugs? Who controls that pipeline of prescriptions? But you know, until some of that changes, um, we really have to address the cost issue because that's really the only place we can put any pressure uh, on this issue. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate the uh, appreciate the phone call. Let's uh, can just stay here with the phones, and now we go to Iowa with Hal. Hal joins us now. Good evening, Hal. Thanks a lot for uh, chiming in here. What's your question or comment? Good evening. You got a great show going. I Thank was you. just wondering, do you think generic drugs are as good as brand name drugs? Sean, you know, we uh, just touched on that a little bit ago. Uh, what do you think? You know, I, I think, again, that's a conversation you need to have with your physician um, um, to, to ask that question. Is there any difference in the ingredients or not? Um, I, I don't want to anecdotally give some bad advice here. So, uh, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a, you know, you need to have that conversation with your physician because if you're looking at cost controls, does that generic is it have the same kind of effect as the name brand, name brand drug? And, and, and most, in most situations they do. So again, please talk to your physician to get the gospel. Yeah, uh, and I think you make a great point here. You've got to have an open conversation, a very frank conversation with your uh, with your physician or your pharmacist to uh, to to really make a decision because it's an individual by individual basis. Uh, Robin from Ohio checks in with us here tonight. First of all, Robin, I hope you've got some really cool stuff to put in a Yeti cooler because you're our winner, and I'm sure that you have a comment or question as well for our panel. Well, yes, I I do have a comment. Um, I had a stroke in my eye about four years ago, and they started me on some generic injections. And unfortunately, after two and a half years, it didn't work. So they had to put me on the uh, name brand Ilea. That's over $2,000 a shot. And if it wasn't for the pharmaceutical company stepping in, I wouldn't be seeing out of my right eye right now. But I'm going on four years of getting these injections every five to seven weeks, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. I'm 59 years old, and I don't think I can ever stop working because I'm never going to be able to afford the high cost of the rising premiums um, that go with, you know, the workforce. Um, I'm just getting concerned that it's just going to get out of control. And I'm thinking about that now because I don't feel that I'm that old, but I'm going to have to retire someday, and, um, you know, where is this going to go, and am I going to be able to afford health insurance when or if I do retire? Sam, Robin brings up a good point. I'm sure that a lot of our audience is, is thinking about this future and down the road and if they'll get backed into a corner. Uh, what's your advice? Yeah, you know, the, the pharmaceutical manufacturer assistance programs – if you can get into them and qualify, can be a great relief. In this instance, a $2,000 prescription, uh, actually injection, um, I'm sure was a, a fraction of that cost uh, in the end. The problem with those programs is they could go away tomorrow. You know, they are, uh, you know, no pharmaceutical manufacturer is beholden to the consumer on the sort of assistance front. So when you have uh, sort of a disjoint between what's covered by, let's say, Medicare or uh, private employer health insurance and what you can get, you know, because of the, you know, pharmaceutical assistance program, when those diverge, you have a real problem because if that was to go away and you were having to pay that full freight of $2,000, I don't know anybody that can afford that. And you start making 
employment, life decisions based on your healthcare needs, and nobody wants to get into that circumstance, right? We all we all want to sort of escape that um, as we get closer to retirement. So I definitely feel uh, for Robin. I, I think she's in a very difficult place. I hope she gets the most that she can out of those pharmaceutical manufacturer assistance programs, uh, and we continue to put pressure on uh, our Medicare Part D programs for people who are on Medicare. If some people are on private insurance, make sure you're talking to your employer to make sure they have coverage that meets your needs. And appeal any coverage. If you if you are denied coverage, um, don't take no for an answer. Appeal those to your health insurance company and always try to get them to find some alternative possibility for you to use uh, rather than just sitting quietly and accepting the fact that you're going to pay maybe all of your month's income on your prescription. Sam, I want to stay here with you because our next caller is also from Wisconsin. Nancy joins us now. Nancy, good evening. Welcome to Rural America Live with AARP. What's your question or comment? Uh, my question is, and, and I, different people have brought this up, that they have um, unused medications and they don't know what to do with them. I mean, you can get these bags that you send them into wherever, you know, if they're they have to be all the same medications. But now my husband had passed away, and we had gotten prescription, several of them, and these are unopened, sealed bottles or like clonidine patches. They're all in sealed boxes, and I was wondering if there's a place that they can be donated for other people to have them. You know, unfortunately, a lot of those prescriptions, once they leave the pharmacist's office, they cannot be reused for other consumer purposes. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about, I've got a blister pack of 20 prescriptions and I only use 10 of them. Can I donate them to someone else? There are some really strict guidelines around pharmaceutical safety that don't allow you to give those to someone else. In fact, in many cases, particularly when you're talking about opiates and other controlled substances, um, you there are programs in counties and municipalities, either through the sheriff's department uh, or, for the, or through the local police department, where they will have prescription disposal um, events where you can come by and safely discard those prescriptions and not worry about, you know, having to throw them in the in the garbage where somebody may get at them or flushing them down the toilet, which is a whole nother issue about water quality. So uh, my advice to you is to call your local sheriff, police department, see if they have a prescription drug disposal day. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's going to be your best option. I don't think actually donating is is going to work um, in, in this case. Sean, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Just just a, a little different, uh, the Sam. Uh, in Oklahoma, we, our two largest counties, Oklahoma County and Tulsa County, several years ago, uh, they did create a program where, again, safety was a very big concern about people donating those uh, unused prescription drugs. But again, they couldn't have been opened any part of it. And, and it, it's a, a county prescription drug program that they turn around and then uh, give to nursing home or they, they collect from nursing homes, for instance, uh, and they give to people in need. So uh, again, Sam is right. Safety is a big critical part of that. Uh, but we've seen a, a few counties in Oklahoma who have collected those unused prescription drugs and uh, helped folks in need. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Let's, it could be uh, something that maybe uh, in your state you could check. Sure. I, I think that's a good point. Well, Sean, let's uh, go right down I-35 to the south to Texas, where Arnold joins us now. Good evening. Welcome to uh, AARP uh, Rural America Live. What's your question or comment? Okay, thank you for having me. Um, my comment is uh, I was having problems with high blood pressure. My primary care doctor was trying his best to assist me and kept uh, prescribing different drugs one after another until finally I was taking two very high-priced drugs, even with my copay, and I have good insurance. So he finally sent me to a cardiac specialist. When I went to a cardiac specialist, he reviewed everything I had done and, and what he was giving me, and the cardiac specialist put me on two generic drugs that are damn near costless. Uh, you know, so 
all my suggestion is sometimes your primary care doctor, which is great and you may love, sometimes you need to go to a specialist and he can see and prescribe you what you need. I mean, he has saved me a lot of money. Sam, does this, uh, does this go back to that, that adage of sometimes getting a second opinion? Oh, these are words to the wise. I mean, this is a great case of, um, you know, a lot of people feel trapped in the prescription drug cycle, so to speak, right? They get, a, you know, one, two, three, seven prescriptions, and sometimes it gets really intimidating to talk to your doctor and say, hey, I need something. This is not working for me financially. I'm having a lot of side effects. It's absolutely critical that people continue throughout their treatment, look for second opinions, and absolutely, whether it's asking the pharmacist or your physician and say, hey, you know, I want to make sure, A, one, I'm safe, that there's no interaction between all these prescription drugs that you've had me on a course of for the last, you know, six months, and then two, be very upfront. Say, I can't afford these prescription drugs. Can we try some generics that might be equivalent uh, and help me in the same way at a much lower cost? Most physicians um, won't, um, you know, sort of shy away from doing that and doing that analysis of your prescription drugs. But this is some of the best advice anyone on this uh, show is going to hear tonight is, Always ask for a second opinion and, and ask for ways to save on your prescription drugs. It's a, a great call and great advice. Okay. Well, Arnold, thank you very much. Uh, good call. Well, from Texas, let's go to the Northwest in Oregon now. Kevin joins us now. Good evening, Kevin. Uh, good to have you on the program with us. And by the way, congratulations. You're a winner of a Yeti cooler. What's your question or comment? Great. Thank you. I was wanting to know, uh, President Trump's been talking about lowering prescription drugs. Do you think that's even attainable with the Congress? Well, with the he doesn't have any by 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 um, we call it bipartisan support at all uh, so far. How doable do you think that really would be to actually get be able to get lowered uh, prescription drugs uh, through the president at this time, Sean? Well, again, uh, it's election year, and this is a great time to hold our members of Congress accountable and ask them what they're going to do to bring the high cost of prescription drugs down. So, again, um, you know, I, th I think if candidates, whether you're president or a member of Congress, who are running on lower prescription drug costs, um, uh, you know, at least President Trump has, has been bringing this issue to the table. So I think this is a great time to make this a campaign issue for people running for office, whether it's your state legislature, your members of Congress in Washington, D.C. But, but again, I, I advocacy do not underestimate it. I mean, I, I, the more people that can express their concern and, and, and bring up the high cost of prescription drugs and share those examples with your members of Congress, they can make the world a difference. And, and again, it's a top priority for ARP fighting the high cost of prescription drugs. So uh, President Trump has talked about it, and now let's demand action that it, 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 it follow, there's a follow through to it as well. Yep, you can give us a call at 877-283-7570 if you want to join the conversation here tonight, just like Pamela has done from Louisiana. Good evening, Pamela. Uh, good to have you on the program. What's your question or comment? Good evening. Well, I've heard from just about Everybody that has the same kind of thing that I do, I take nine pills a day for one thing and another. Of course, I'm getting old. But one of my uh, prescriptions was for acid reflux. The acid reflux has damaged my esophagus, and we're trying to get it healed up. So I had to have a special medication, and it was Terafate. Well, they, my insurance company, which I get with the state school system, bless their hearts, I wouldn't have any health coverage if I didn't have that. And they, uh, I called, they quoted me a price of $600 a month for this medicine to control my acid reflux. And so I called the company because it was not on their formulary. It was not covered on there. That medicine was not on their formulary. 
and you could get a special dispensation if you called and talked to the insurance company, and it was a Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I called and I spoke to several of the representatives about that, and so they are now letting me take, I now get the generic, Instead of the brand kerosene, I'm getting the generic, and instead of six hundred dollars a month, it's costing me thirty. Ain't that good? Sam, she, um, well, I tell you what, that's a that's a that's big great. difference. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, I mean, here's here's somebody who's their own best advocate, right? You know, I mean. She took the bull by the horns. Uh, she called up the insurance company and said, there's got to be something else we can do. And that's exactly what you have to do. You know, we talked about it in Robin's case about her medication that's over $2,000. I mean, you do, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that will help you financially with prescription drugs, you got to be your own best advocate, it, whether it's calling a pharmaceutical company to ask for uh, maybe free samples, whether it's asking your doctor to help you find a generic, whether it's calling your insurance company to appeal a coverage change. It seems like we shouldn't have to work this hard uh, to get affordable prescription drugs. But I mean, this is a, just an amazing case of going from $600 a month to $30 a month. That's phenomenal. And um, all through one person's advocacy. Uh, so I heard the I heard the excitement in her voice. She should be excited. She she worked herself a pretty good deal there. So um, good for her, and I'm glad it's working for her. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's go to Maine now, and Merton joins us. Uh, Merton, what's your question or comment tonight? I just have a comment. I'm 79 years old, and the last time I was I had a Class A driver's license, tractor trailer. 1980 was the last time I had a physical, and I haven't been to a doctor since. Take no prescriptions whatsoever. I think I have a flock of angels watching over me. That's my comment. And Abs I was Absolutely. Uh, I think he does also, Sean, don't you? Yeah, uh, he may have some good genetics there. Um, but uh, taking care of yourself, um, trying to be healthy, eating right, um, you know, hand it to him. We'll have to figure out how he does that. He may have some more secrets to tell us. Okay. Well, I tell you what, we're going to take another short break. We still have a Yeti cooler to give away, and the phone lines are open. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. 877-283-7570. Join the conversation. We want to know how you're saving on your prescription drugs. Maybe you have tips that others can use. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay alert. Watch for all the financial scams going on in this challenging time. Don't deal with anybody but a trusted family member or a business associate, banker, lawyer, financial advisor. It's way too easy to get caught up in today's unreliable information and enticing offers. Make sure you know who you're dealing with in these troubled times. This is good advice. Listen. And thanks from the Oak Ridge Boys for that message and welcome back. We have another Yeti cooler to give away, so we're going to go right straight back to the phones. We've got a hot button topic tonight, and that is the cost of prescription drugs. So let's go to Ron in Arizona, first thing right here. And good evening, Ron. Welcome. You're up here. What's, uh, what's on your mind? Well, uh, about three years, four years ago, it was uh, uh, my doctor, uh, I got in a donut hole. I'm on Medicare, and they, I take uh, Genuvia. I'm a diabetic, and he, I told him that uh, I couldn't afford, I got in a donut hole, and I couldn't afford this medicine because it was $400 for a 90-day prescription. Well, he said, I can help you with that. He said, uh, I'll fax your prescription to Canada, and you call, he gave me the number. He said, you call them, and they'll give you the cost of this drug, and if it suits you, you can go ahead and order it to them. Well, I did so, and I've been doing it ever since. It's $160 for 30, 90 days, and they wanted 400 for it. That was four years ago. Don't tell them what it is now, Genovia. 
But anyway, it saved me a lot of money. I thought I'd tell you, viewers, you can get this through Canada. You don't have to buy it out of the United States if your doctor will take care of it. Sam, you're, uh, that's just your next door neighbor there. Uh, is, this, is this rather common? Well, uh, buying prescriptions, for, whether it be from Canada or Mexico, we heard earlier the caller um, who said she goes to Mexico when she can, although unfortunately she can't always, um, to get lower prescription drug costs. You know, there are limit limitations to how much prescription drug or how many pres prescription drugs, excuse me, you can import, but you can import for personal use um, safely. And so if you have, through your physician, a connection to a Canadian pharmacy where you can make that happen and that arrangement is safe and trusted by your personal physician, I think it should absolutely be explored. Most people that we're, you know, being in Wisconsin, they're going to drive up, they're going to go over the border, closer to Winnipeg and some of the over-the-border communities and fill their prescriptions in person. But um, I, I think people need to explore every option they can. I would be very cautious, though, and I'm glad this has worked out. There are on the Internet more, you know, fraudulent and unsafe websites than you can shake a stick at and people need to be really careful about what they get on the internet that they're promising prescriptions for you know rock bottom prices you don't know where those pills are coming from you don't know if they have the bio ingredients that they should so be really cautious but it is an option if you can find uh, a, a safe channel to do so uh there's the key have a safe channel and uh and make sure that it's trusted um i, I think that's a good point well, uh, right now on the phone, we go to Fred in Wyoming. Fred, it's good to have you on the program with us tonight. By the way, congratulations. You're the winner of a Yeti cooler. So uh, what, do you, what do you have on your mind tonight? Well, um, I turned 65 last October, and I've been uh, really concerned with all the retirement issues. And I've... Uh, been working full time for the state, uh, driving snow plow here, and have good insurance, and so it's really blessed me and uh, everything I have had to do. Um, and the pharmacy I use also has um, my doctor prescribed a, a high blood pressure and cholesterol medicine for me, and they said that there's a, an injection that I could take that would uh, take the place of these pills, and but it might be a little expensive. And it was $240, and the pharmacist looked around and found it for $20. And so I was started on that, and, and it worked really well and lowered my cholesterol from 170 down to uh, 70. And so I uh, was really pleased with that. And so I've been able to stop taking a lot of the pills, but... I'm really worried listening to all the things I hear on this show and others like it and looking online and seeing the, the things about uh, retirement insurance. And, and I know, too, that a lot of the medical professionals will charge exactly what the insurance companies will pay the maximum amount. And so it's kind of scary when you're on the outside looking in like that. And, and especially when I know I'm going to have to sign up for all these other parts once I uh, stop working for the state and have to provide my own insurance. And so I'm really uh, concerned about these things, and I appreciate all the input I've heard tonight. Well, thank you very much, Fred. And Sean, um, you know, he makes a good point here is it just seems like with these high costs, it's got everybody very concerned, just like, like he is. Um, but it seems like uh, th there's information from all different angles that you just have to really pay close attention because you're just bombarded with all different kinds of options. Is, is that factual? It is. Um, the good part is it, there should be, uh, you know, Medicare it becomes a primary, and then the state insurance would become a secondary. And so there should be uh, some pretty good cost savings uh, for, for him because I, I th that would be pretty good insurance. But again, I, I, I think it's so important uh, they brought out talking to your pharmacist 
we have heard talking to your primary care physician, and then we heard talk to a specialist to get those those uh, lower costs. So, um, you know, we've heard that again and again tonight. But again, um, every state should have a Medicare assistance program with their many states. It's through their state insurance department, and those individuals provide free counseling service. They'll help you identify a Medicare plan, a Part D plan, and they'll help you find the, the cheaper option for you. And so, again, there are lots of resources. You can uh, go to Good Good RX to to uh, to compare prices, prescription drugs. We we heard about earlier, uh, NeedyMeds.org can also help you find cheaper uh, prescription drugs as well. So. There are a lot of resources. It's just trying to navigate that. And, and remember, once you're on Medicare, there's some other help as well. Sean, let's, uh, let's go to your home state, Oklahoma. Joan joins us now. Good evening, Joan. Yeah. Welcome to the program. What's your Great. question or comment? Well, I have a positive comment. I'm, from listening on there, I'm sure glad I live in Oklahoma. I'm 92 years old, and I have quite a few things <laughs> I have to have. I have some very important ones, like I have ASB, you might know that, and my medicine for that was going to be very high. Do you know that I get it, and I pay $8.40 a month, and the doctor had told me, when they first told me, this is years ago That's when great. I first had my ASB attack, and he said, I'd like you to try this one. He said, if it's too expensive, he said, I'll write you a cheaper one, but he said, I'd like you to try this one. It has not given me trouble. And that price has kept going down. I think part of it is that my uh, insurance, um, Medicare, I think is what we call it, I think it pays part of my bills. But I noticed this antibiotic I had to get today, or yesterday, I guess it was, my insurance company paid $20.80. That was for 14 tablets. I paid $3.60. And that is the way with all of my prescriptions. I'll, I admit that these are generic. If it's an antibiotic and it works, can't be too bad. <laughs> and uh, I, I just am very happy with it. I am. I, I have cholesterol and I have blood pressure, and I'm 92 years old. I'm happy, and I think I'm blessed. I just wanted to say something positive for Oklahoma. Well, well Joan, th <laughs> yeah, Joan, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the positive comments. Yeah, yeah that's. That's really encouraging. You know, as, as we wrap up tonight's show, Sean, you have some cost-saving tips uh, that you can pass yeah. along and, and share. You bet. And it's so great to hear a lot of those cost-saving tips uh, on the phone and, and hearing from Joan from Oklahoma. So, yeah, we've got a few other ones. And I want to talk about asking about non-drug uh, uh, alternatives. You know, what can I do with my my lifestyle? Uh, reducing alcohol intake is important. Stress-reducing techniques. But also another one you may not be aware of is through Medicare, there are, there are some preventive services that are free. So an annual wellness visit, depression screen screening and obesity screening and counseling. So take advantage if you're on Medicare of some of the free screening as well as uh, non-prescription drug alternatives. I think the other area we can look at are seeking cheaper alternatives, asking for over-the-counter generics if possible. We've heard a lot of great examples tonight of people doing that, and we've heard a lot of great savings with them as well. You may also look into a, a mail order, getting a 90-day supply versus 30. That could be savings right there. Shop different pharmacies and ask if they know of any rebates. And we've talked about that tonight as well. And uh, again, checking with the manufacturer for rebates. Again, go to needymeds.org or GoodRx to compare prescription drug prices as well. And we also talk about shopping around for your prescription drugs with large box stores can sometimes have the best price available. Again, websites like Good uh, GoodRx, club memberships like SAMs or Costco's, they offer discounts on prescription drugs. Uh, and if you're on Medicare, picking the right plan or supplement or Part D can have a big impact as well. And again, the Medicare Assistance Program through the state insurance department in your state will provide you free unbiased information that can help you pick the right and most economic plan for you. So last but not least, you know, Medicare Part D enrollment starts October 15th through December 7th. So be thinking about that. There may be some opportunities for you to change up your plan and, and, and bring the list of prescription drugs that you have. So a lot of great options. 
Thanks, Sean. Sam, we're going to move away from drug cost savings so we can take a forward look at the upcoming election. AARP, I know, has been working with state leaders. What do you have to share with uh, our audience here tonight? I've been reading some of this. Well, in an, any normal election year, we'd just be talking about issues. But 2020 is anything but a normal election year. And one of the top priorities for AERP is ensuring that people are able to cast their vote safely. So, uh, you know, we know that folks, whether it's in person, whether they decide to vote safely from home, um, or if they still need to register to vote. These are all concerns that we have when people aren't being able to go out and about like they would in any normal election year. So we've got some uh, a lot of good information uh, on that for each individual state, but we also want to make sure people are still asking the tough questions. We had several callers who are saying, what are people doing on prescription drugs? We do want to continue to ask candidates, what's their priorities around Medicare? What's their priorities around Social Security? What are their priorities around prescription drugs? So we're really telling people, we have a great resource at aerp.org slash election guides. That's aerp.org slash election guides. And there you'll get safe voting tips as well as information on priority issues for AERP. All right. Well, very good. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your, uh, for uh, being here tonight and uh, answering all these questions. Uh, certainly has been a pleasure. Uh, Sean Voskel here with us uh, this evening, as well as Sam Wilson joining us here for AARP. Well, that's going to wrap things up. Join us next month, September 17th, when we share tips on how to survive almost anything. From all of us, good night from Rural America's most important network.